Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. This video is the 20th lecture in our wood design series, and this video will be following up from the previous video, looking at examples of determining the beam stability factor and applying the equations and provisions of the NDS. Uh, the lovely music for this video again comes from Daniel Birch's album, Ambient Volume 1, and a link in it is again included in the video description. Alright, let's go ahead and get started with our first example here. A number 2 DFL Douglas fir large 2x12 is simply supported and braced against rotation at its ends. Determine the maximum amount of factored live load it can carry in pounds per foot while not exceeding the limits of the NDS provisions. So the first thing I'm going to do is to get some uh, basic geometric properties. And the first thing I want to get is let's go ahead and get the uh, uh, unbraced length. That's going to be our LU that we referenced in the previous video. And this first one is going to be relatively simple. So we're just going to say LU in this case is just going to be equal to the overall uh, beam length of 15 feet. Then we do need some uh, section properties, and in particular we need one section property, and that is the elastic section modulus. The elastic section modulus. And to get that, we're going to go to our NDS supplement, and we could uh, calculate it from basic mechanics, or we could just look it up in table 1b here. For a 2x12, uh, let's see, it's strong axis. Uh, elastic section modulus is 31.64 inches to the fourth, or inches to the third, sorry. Uh, 31.64 inches to the third. We need to make sure that is a defined unit. And that is entered. And of course, I am, uh, if you're not familiar with this program, I'm doing this in SMath. And I do actually have a short video series on that if you're uh, curious about how to use this program. It's very much just a uh, sort of an open source, well, free open source uh, MathCAD uh, clone. So just double checking. Uh, yeah, 31.64 inches to the third. All right, and then now that we have our uh, geometric properties, our dimensional properties, our next step is going to be is going to be to get some reference design values. So I'm going to go to uh, right here to table 4a in the NDS supplement and scroll down to Douglas fir, uh, to Douglas fir larch. Now, not Douglas fir larch north, that's a different species combination than regular old DFL, and we're looking at the number two, and we are dealing with, not, with uh, two inches and wider, so our uh, reference design values for visually graded dimensional lumber, two inches to four inches thick, all species except southern pine is applicable. If we had a large timber, we would use a different table. Now, uh, so let's go over to the uh, number two, the number two grade uh, here, and we're gonna have we're gonna need two particular values for this. Uh, we're gonna need the reference bending stress, and we're going to need the E min, the uh, statistical minimum modulus of elasticity. So FB, uh, as we've discussed in previous videos, there is a lot that goes into determining these values. There's a lot of factors of safety baked in, there's a lot of statistical analysis baked in, but uh, FB is our reference bending stress. Now we need E min, and I didn't discuss E min much in the uh, previous video, but the difference between E and E min is, uh, one way you can sort of think about it is the regular E is kind of the expected um, modulus of elasticity for a given beam, for a given material, but the E min is sort of the, uh, well, as it says, is kind of the minimum. In other words, like if you, in reality, as we've discussed in previous videos, every property is going to be a bell curve across certain you know, numbers of samples, and the minimum is going a certain number of standard deviations towards the low end. So if you go two or three standard deviations to the left on that bell curve, what is the minimum uh, expected value that you could find for your modulus of elasticity? And that's what we use in one of our one of the uh, one of the sub calculations for the uh, beam stability factor, which we'll be doing in a bit. So the first thing we need is our reference bending stress, and that will be 900 psi. And that's. And so that is, and it's always good practice to put a citation. So that's going to be table 4a. 
And I'm going to say FB, and that was equal to 900 PSI. Then, our minimum reference uh, elastic modulus, also table 4A. And this value, if we go down here, is going to be, for our number 2, is going to be uh, 580,000 PSI. Hundred and eighty thousand PSI. If I can manage to look a value up in the table correctly, that's uh, <laughs> if uh, if that is the case. And I seem to have not managed to screw that simple task up. So <laughs> let's continue. All right. Now that we have our basic material properties, our next step is going to be to uh, start to calculate our beam stability factor. So uh, going here, table three point three point three. Um, we can see that we need to first get our effective length from our unbraced length. Now, in order to do that, however, we need to first have the ratio between our unbraced length and our beam depth. So let's go, and get, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, let's see, uh, beam unbraced length uh, to depth ratio. Well, I probably should go ahead and actually define the uh, beam depth. I can put the I can put those in the geometric properties. So beam width, uh, it is a two by twelve. So if you remember our properties for uh, sawn lumber, all species except uh, southern pine, well, actually just for standard southern, standard dress lumber, a two by twelve is going to be uh, not exactly two and a half. It's not exactly two inches by twelve inches. But of course, one and one half inches by eleven and one quarter inches. Isn't the English system of units wonderful? Um, so, again, our uh, beam width is going to be uh, one point five inches, and our beam depth uh, here is going to be oh, okay, that was mixed up a bit. 11.25 inches. Let's go ahead and fix that. Get everything lined up nice. Lined up nice and pretty. And there we have that. Okay. So we have our beam width and our beam depth. And now I want to get the ratio of unbraced length to depth. And remember, in this case, our, um, uh, our unbraced length is just the full 15 feet uh, because we have uh, only lateral uh, rotational bracing. On the, on the two ends of the beam. So let's go ahead and get that. LU over D. Now, uh, this, this program handles your uh, unit conversions, so uh, I don't need to put any kind of conversion factor in here. But of course, if you were doing this um, by hand, you would want to have some sort of unit conversion uh, factor in your calculation. Okay, so we get an LU, uh, an LU over D ratio of 16. So we have, so we're in this uh, category over here. Uh, for single span beams, LU over D is greater than or equal to seven, and um, our effective length for a uniformly distributed load is going to be equal to one point six three times the unbraced length plus three times the depth of the beam. So basically, there are a whole series of equations here, depending on your. Uh, uh, unbraced length to depth ratio, your unbraced length, uh, your support conditions, your load conditions, etc. So in this case, we have a single span, simply supported beam with a uniform load over the top. We've determined that our LU over D ratio is greater than or equal to seven. So we're in this column here and we're looking at a uniformly distributed load. So we apply a uh, uh, and, and, and in the case of a, sim a single simply supported beam, so we're going to apply this equation here. So we're looking at, uh, let me just go ahead and copy that, and I can easily then enter this on my sheet here. So then my effective length, uh, referencing that is a simple span, uh, and also uniform load 
because we're being asked here to find our uh, maximum allowable uniform load. Our unbraced length then is just going to be 1.63 times our unbraced length plus three times our beam depth. And again, if uh, S-Math will take care of our unit conversions, but um, if you were doing this by hand, you'd want to include uh, some sort of unit conversion. I'll just go ahead and display that in feet. So we see here that our effective length is much is actually much larger than our unbraced length. Now that we have our unbraced length, our next step is going to be to get our slender initial uh, ratio RB, which is given by equation 3.3-5 in the NDS specification. So again, I'll just copy that over for the sake of uh, uh, for the sake of uh, entering it into my my little uh, worksheet here. So RB, this is going to be equal to the square root of the effective length times D divided by B squared. And that comes out to 40 point, a oh, whole bunch of decimal places. And it likes to display way more decimal places than I should, so I'll just go ahead and get and trim that a bit. And also critically, if you remember from the previous uh, lecture, we saw that the limiting value on this is 50. We are not allowed to go over 50 in terms of our slenderness ratio here. And if you do, then you have to select a different section. Um, either brace it, uh, provide some intermittent break, provide some intermittent bracing or uh you know select a member with a uh you know a large a uh, a wider uh width or a uh, uh well if you look at the depth over actually i guess you would need a if you look at this equation here i guess you would need a to make rb smaller you would need yeah a, a wider uh width b or a smaller depth d okay so we have our uh rb ratio now, the next step is going to be to get these two values here, FB star and FBE. So I'm just gonna put these this here for reference. Now, FB star, um, this is just your, uh, um, I'll just call this the modified uh, reference bending stress. And this is a special case of the modified bending stress. This is the modified bending stress multiplied by all adjustment factors, all applicable adjustment factors, except CV and CL. So we, we wouldn't want to use, multiply CL in this case because we're actually trying to calculate CL. So if we had to, um, if we had to include CL in this calculation, we would end up with a recursive loop, a, you know, a, a, a self-referencing loop, which wouldn't be very fun. Although I suppose you do sometimes deal with that in engineering, um, so I guess we'd have to iterate in that case, but thankfully that is not the case here. Now, you will s now when we look at the adjustment factors, we will see that I've actually carefully chosen this problem to minimize the amount of adjustment factors that we have to apply. So when we go to our, our SON lumber of uh, applicable design factors, or applicable adjustment factors. I selected, uh, I said it was live load, so we don't have to worry about CD. I didn't say anything about wet or hot conditions, so we don't have to worry about CM or CT. Beam stability factor is what we're calculating, and the rest of these we haven't really explored yet, but um, take my word for it that these, in this case, all of these would be one. I, again, particularly chose um, this uh, actual beam uh, support conditions and uh, section in order to make as many of these factors one as possible. So the size factor is something you do actually normally need to consider. And we'll look at that, uh, actually the next thing we look at after our beam stability factor and lateral torsional buckling will be the size factor. So that'll be coming out in a future video. But uh, for now, just take my word for it that the factor here in this case is going to be one. So because of that, again, the uh, FB star factor or the FB star value is our reference design uh, bending stress, our FB, times all of these factors, all these factors here, except it's the beam stability factor 
and uh, well, CV is something that you, you that we'll see when we look at glue lamp beams. But um, in the case of sawn lumber, it, in the case of just sawn lumber, it's going to be uh, all of the factors here, all of the applicable factors here except CL. But in this case, we don't have to worry about that. So our FB star is just going to be equal to FB. Now, uh, now, on this, it isn't able to do an asterisk very well, so I'm just going to call this FB star like this. And again, this is just equal to FB, not generally, but in our particular case. I, and the big things again were I, I chose a two by twelve section, which will result in a, um, a size factor of one for this type of lumber. And I selected a, uh, I, I step specified that we were dealing specifically with live load. So our load duration factor was one. All of those are very important. And of course, since I didn't reference, uh, didn't state we were dealing with exterior conditions uh, or warm conditions or anything like that, our temperature factors and our wet surface factors do not apply. So, and we want this in PSI. Okay, next we need to get FBE, which is just a simple calculation. It's just a, uh, a modified bending stress. Another modified uh, And actually, there might be a better name for that. Let me check the uh, variables in the NDS. If you're ever wondering what something is, you can go to the applicable section, the notation section. Ah, sorry, I knew there was a better word for that. This FBE is the critical, critical buckling design value for bending members. So this is actually based on uh, a buckling calculation, a lateral torsional buckling similar to, uh, again, similar to, well, I shouldn't say similar, but related to Euler column buckling, but of course lateral torsional buckling does have its own derivations and theory behind it. So uh, let's go here, back up to our section that we're looking at. Uh, where did you go? Okay, there we are. And so uh, we want FBE, uh, which is the critical uh, bending stress value, or crit critical buckling stress value. Actually, you know what? I want to make sure I get the exact wording, just for the sake of being complete. Got off on a tangent there. So, let's see here. Where was that hiding? FBE. FBE. Where are we hiding? Okay, here we go. Critical, uh, critical buckling design value for bending members. Okay. So, I'm going to call this critical... Um, buckling stress for bending members. Lovely. And then I have that there, so I'm just going to call this FBE, capital E, and this is equal to 1.20 times uh, E prime min over RB squared. Now, we do immediately have one issue with this E prime min. We have E min, but not E prime min. And if you remember back to how we handle uh, adjustment factors, E prime or FB prime or anything prime, any stress value prime, refers to the modified version. So I want to go ahead and get the adjusted minimum uh, elastic modulus. And if we look at uh, our table, we could see that, look at, uh, our table 4.3.1 here, we can see the applicable factors that are applied to E prime min. And again, the CM and CT aren't gonna matter, and sizing factor is not important here. Um, buckling stiffness factor, that's more for trusses, that's why there's a T there, so we don't need to worry about that. So in this case, again, um, just like in the case of our FB, our E prime min is just going to be equal to our E min, because this is just a simple example, uh, example number one. So I'm just gonna say e prime dot min. This is equal to e dot min, um, just equal to e dot min. But again, depending on what type of uh, details and what type of system, what type of element you're designing, you could easily have adjustment factors applied to that. So now that we can actually now now we can actually get our FBE. So this is equal to e prime dot min divided by. R B squared. 
and that will get a uh, reference stress or a critical buckling stress of 425 PSI. And trim the number of decimal places doesn't look quite so ridiculous. All right, so we have our critical buckling stress. And if we go back to our equations, after 3.3.3, after that big table, we can see that we are about ready to calculate our, oh, where did you go again? Okay, we can see that we're about ready to calculate our CL value. So we have our FBE, we have our FB star, we have our, our RB, so really all that's left is to apply uh, equation 3.3-6 in order to calculate our uh, final beam stability factor. And this one is the fun one. Let's go ahead and get that. And I'm just gonna plop that down there so I can reference it. So beam stability factor. And I'll reference NDS 3.3-6. Ooh, okay, so when putting together an equation um, this hairy, it's always useful to break things down if you can. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an intermittent calculation that I'm just going to call the stress ratio, which is just going to be FBE over FB star. So let's just call that FB ratio, and that's going to be equal to FBE over FBE here divided by FB uh, star. Where did I call that? Let's see. FB star. And in this case, this ratio is about 0.47. So now I don't have to type this in. So basically here, here, and here, um, I'm going to inc I'm just going to have the FB ratio uh, parameter instead of the uh, instead of the uh, whole fraction, and that will just make the equation a little easier to prove and just a little prettier on our page here. So our so let's go ahead and get the beam stability factor then. So this is going to be one plus our FB ratio divided by 1.9. And then minus, oh, God, I don't want that on. Gotta make sure we got that in the right place. Then insert a square root. And we will have, uh, let's see, uh, we need this parentheses squared. So we want, and then a quotient in there, one plus our FB ratio, and then divided by 1.9. So let's see, one plus our FB ratio, divided by 1.9, all that squared, and then um, subtracted by another quotient, which is going to be our, our stress ratio, divided by 0 0.95, and we get 0 0.454. So we actually, we have our final CL value now. Uh, so we have done the hard work part, we have done the, we've done the hard part now, we have actually determined our uh, our uh, beam stiffness ratio. And actually, this is quite a low value. Notice we are losing over half of our actual uh, allowable bending stress due to instability in this beam. And really, that shouldn't be a big surprise. A, a 2i12, I mean, that's a decent sized member, but it's really not that large. And this is a 15 feet long, which, I mean, it's not the biggest room in the world. This would be like over a... I mean, I guess that would be the roof of a, the ceiling or of a decent size, ce ceiling or uh, floor of a decent size bedroom or something like that in, the, in, in a certain dimension. So, I mean, it's not the largest one in the world, but still that's a good span. 15 feet is a good span for a, especially for a two by 12. And critically, we have no lateral bracing here. We're bracing it at this end and at this end, but with no other intermediate uh, lateral bracing. So, Really, this isn't the best method of design. We could get a lot more, um, we could have a much more efficient beam if we just provided some intermittent bracing, but we'll talk about what that looks like another time. So we have that. So now we have this and we'll go ahead and uh, finish the problem up and calculate a, um, turn this into a bent to a, a uh, allowable bending stress and finally a maximum allowable distributed live load.
So we now have our beam stability factor, and all that we need to do now is to calculate our adjusted um, bend allowable bending stress. So this is going to be not FB, but FB prime. And I like usually put it like F prime dot B like that. And again, because almost all of our factors are going to be equal to one in this case, the only one that isn't equal to one is our CL. So we just need to multiply our FB times our uh, beam stability factor. And that uh, produces that value in Pascals, if you're curious, or 409 PSI. Again, we are losing over half our allowable bending stress um, due to this, due to beam instability. Okay, so we have this, uh, and now we just need to translate this into a, um, into a, first into a, an allowable moment, and then into a allowable, um, into a uh, allowable uh, distributed live load. All right, so I just need to finish this problem up. And if we remember back to basic mechanics, or we can actually uh, look up the uh, equations, the basic mechanics equations here in uh, section 3.3, we have FB, our bending stress, our elastic bending stress, is equal to M over S. So that's what we're going to use because we've already adjusted it um, for beam stability. So we're going to take this equation, 3.3-2, and uh, use it to calculate the moment because we have our allowable bending stress, our FB, and now we just need to back calculate our moment. So maximum applied moment. And that's just going, I'm just going to use a, a capital M for this. And this of course is just going to be F, our allowable um, bending stress, again adjusted for um, beam instability, times our elastic section modulus. And that's going to come to a final value. Uh, I know SMETH, want, you want to do joules, go home, you're drunk. Instead, we're going to do uh, kips times inches. That makes me happy. Okay, so we have, uh, let's say that many decimal places. Looks about right, because we don't want to have 12 decimal places, otherwise we'll look like idiots. So let's not do that. And finally, uh, we can apply our, uh, perhaps one of the most famous equations in structural and civil engineering, that, uh, of course, being WL max moment for a simply supported uniform uh, loaded beam is M is WL squared over 8. So again, we know that M equals WL squared over 8, or if I back calculate this and, ca and solve for uh, W, I will get that the uh, maximum distributed load well, let's see. That's just going to be M. Well, I probably should call this W. W is equal to M times 8 divided by... Oh, I'll actually put that on the whole thing. It won't matter according to, order of, or according to order of operations, but it will look better if I do it this way. Now, L. So this is where it gets a little interesting. What L do we use? Do we use the uh, beam length, the unbraced length, the effective length? Well, because this is just uh, calculating moments from um, from applied load, or in this case, uh, calculating applied load from moments, this is basic static, so we don't have to worry about the um, the effects of beam instability. We're just going to use the beam length, uh, the overall beam length, which in this case is equal to the unbraced length. But if we had, for example, a um, a, a beam that was braced in the middle, our unbraced length would be equal to 7.5 feet. But when calculating our uh, basic statics moment, we would still use the entire beam length. So, um, I'm in fact to uh, to uh, illustrate the point, really drive the point home. I'm just going to create an entirely different variable, and I'm going to define this as the uh, beam length, not the unbraced length, and not the effective length, but just the beam length. And maybe, I, maybe I'll even say for statics calculations. Isn't this wonderful? We have three different lengths we have to keep track of. We have our 
actual beam length, which you use for uh, purposes of calculating, uh, you know, uh, distributed loads, moments, that sort of thing. We have our unbraced length, which comes from the uh, looking at the actual details of the plans um, and what you're looking at in terms of where lateral bracing is provided. And then you have your effective length, which you have to calculate. So isn't structural engineering wonderful? Um, so L in this case is just equal to 15 feet. And to calculate our W then, we just divide by L squared, and this should give us a value of, again, go home, S math, you're drunk. Um, I'm just going to say pound force per foot, and I get a maximum allowable live load of 38.3 uh, pound force per foot, or just pounds per foot. And if I was feeling fancy, I could even put a box around that, indicate that, that is our final uh, desired answer. So again, let's review through what we just did here. We had a simply supported uh, beam carrying a uniform um, live load. And that live load, because it was a live load, we knew our load duration factor was going to be one. And because of the two by 12, because it was a two by 12, we didn't have to worry, or we, it's not that we didn't have to worry, but our um, size factor is going to be equal to one. So basically this was carefully chosen. So all of the factors except for um, our uh, beam stability factor is going to be our equal to one. So um, all we had to do is calculate our beam stability factor. We uh, get our section properties. We look up our reference uh, stress values. We calculate our unbraced length. Uh, we get our unbraced uh, length to depth ratio. Based on that and our support conditions and our load conditions, we calculate our effective length from our unbraced length uh, using equations from table 3.3.3. Then, once we have our effective length, we get our slenderness ratio. Then, we cal then based on that, uh, we make sure it doesn't exceed 50. And then we calculate our intermittent stress values, our intermediate stress values, FB star, E prime min, and FBE. And then we go and calculate our, uh, our final beam stability factor. And finally, we take that uh, calculate a adjusted allowable bending stress, again, adjusted for beam stability this time. And finally, we go and calculate what we were looking for, which in this case is our allowable maximum distributed load, which we found comes in this case to 38.3 pounds per foot. And that is the simplest case, <laughs> yes, the simplest case of applying uh, the uh, equations of lateral torsional buckling the N and NDS methods to calculate a uh, beam stability factor. This is actually about as simple as it gets. All right, now let's consider a second example. And this one's going to be related very closely to uh, the first one. All I've done is taken the same beam and added lateral bracing at the third points. So this beam is still being supported at its at either end. In other words, there's not like a um, there's a column on this end, a column on this end, or maybe another beam here, or another beam here that this that this two by twelve beam is resting on. There's in other words, there's some sort of support, either a wall, a beam, a column. Uh, on each end is what at, there's some sort of support on each end, and that's what's actually holding the beam up. But in terms of lateral support, I've added lateral bracing at the third points. So let's let's go through this and see what things change, what things don't change, and how this affects our ultimate allowable uh, distributed load capacity. So the first thing is that our unbraced length is going to be is going to uh, drop from 15 feet to 5 feet. And uh, our elastic section modulus and other geometric properties, well, these aren't going to change. Uh, the reference bending stress again none of that's going to change uh because um those are none of the none of the things that go into those uh well actually those are just reference values so those won't change because we're not changing the member size or anything like that but what does change is our unbraced length to depth ratio and so th we need to double check that our effective length equation isn't going to change so let's go ahead and look at our table 3.3.3 here. And uh, we still have a uniform distributed load. And with uniformly distributed load, it's relatively simple. You just have to look at whether your uh, unbraced length to depth is less than seven or greater than seven. And we are now less than seven. And so we can use the 
2.06 times LU instead of the previous 1.63 time, uh, times LU plus three times the depth. So this one here is going to be applicable. So we'll go ahead and change that. So this is now just, again, uh, 2.06 times the unbraced length. And this means now that our this now means our effective length is 10.3 feet. Uh, that cascades down, and our, our B factor, uh, our not our B factor, our slenderness ratio is now uh, much less at 20 about at about 25, less than 50, no problem there. Uh, our modified uh, reference bending stress and our critical buckling stress, uh, well, the FB star isn't going to change, and because um, that's just because there are no factors that we're applying to that in this particular problem. And also, our critical bending stress will change, but it's the same exact formula as previously, so uh, S-Math has already automatically taken care of that. So this is changing substantially, though. And then our stress ratio, that's just going to be calculated as is. And our CL now um, can be calculated. And instead of the previous uh, 0.45, we now have 0.89. So our adjusted allowable bending stress, instead of being reduced by over 50%, about 55%, it's now only being reduced by 11%. So then our adjusted allowable bending stress um, becomes 801 PSI. And our beam length for statics calculations won't change, because um, that's still just the overall beam length. But our now our maximum allowable distributed live load is going to be 75 pounds per foot instead of our previous 38. So if I were to do a, a you know very quick ratio here, 75.1 divided by what is that 38.3, I can see that just by changing the conditions of lateral bracing, the amount of distributed load or the amount of load that this beam can carry has increased by nearly a factor of two. We, we can see from this that beam, st that beam stability is absolutely critical for uh, flexural members. Um, so again, beam stability is absolutely critical for flexural members. And again, I haven't changed anything about this beam except where it's laterally braced. I haven't changed what it's made of. I haven't changed the grade of the material. I haven't changed the species. I haven't used a larger section. It's literally the exact same beam. The only difference is that I've changed how it's braced on its compression flange against rotation. So this is, I, I like this example because it very uh, simply and directly illustrates and compares to the previous one, illustrating the effects of um, lateral bracing and how they can dramatically change um, the allowable distributed load on a flexural member. All right, now let's consider an example that uh, is, uh, well, let's just say a little bit trickier. We have the same beam, except this time I'm using it as a continuous beam rather than as a simply supported beam. So I've, uh, I have a support, a vertical support on the left and a vertical support five feet from the right. And so we have this uh, two span beam, well, one span plus a cantilever. Okay, so the tricky part about this is really comes down to the bracing or how I phrase this here. Notice I said, assume that the brace or that the beam is braced at its top along its entire length. So basically what that means is that at the top of the beam, it's going to be braced all the way along, but there is no bracing along the bottom of the beam. Now, if you think about positive moment, that's going to be fine for positive moment because with positive moment, your compression is at the top of the beam. So we're providing adequate uh, restraint, lateral restraint, all the way along the beam for positive bending. However, for negative bending, we aren't providing any restraint. If you have a reversal of curvature, which you do have in this case with the cantilever, because of that reversal of curvature, you now have tension at the top of the beam and compression at the bottom. So suddenly our uh, bracing isn't doing anything in the case of our um, negative moment region. So let's go ahead and consider that though. So what we're gonna need to do is we're going to need to, to check this or design this based on both the positive moment region and the negative moment region. 
So first of all, let's determine it, the maximum allowable distributed load, uh, distributed live load, based on the positive moment region. And if you're having trouble visualizing what this is going to look like, I looked this up in a beam table and found this, uh, these equations here. We could also derive these from statics, that wouldn't be too difficult, but to save some time uh, on this already long video, I'm just uh, using a reference. And so, um, if you look at this, we have our positive negative, our positive moment region, and then uh, a certain distance, uh, a certain distance from our support, we have an inflection point, and then we have a negative moment region. Okay, so uh, well, let's first consider the positive moment region, and our um, let's see, our uh, beam depth and beam geometry isn't going to change. However, our unbraced length will change from from our previous case. We do not have uh, we we have continuous bracing. We effectively have continuous bracing, but just for the positive moment case. So our unbraced length there is going to be equal to ten feet. So for the rest of this, I can then just go and copy calculations from uh, the previous section, well, at least until we get to the moment calculation. Uh, the reference stresses aren't going to change. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see why. Oh, I see an issue. So it's spitting out an error because it's getting an infinity here. But if you know, if you remember, if we uh, look back at the NDS provisions, we can see that when the, um, whenever you have an unbraced length equal to zero, in other words, you have continuous support, you don't actually need to go and calculate all of this other stuff because our beam stability factor is just going to be equal to one. In other words, if you have a continuous bracing, beam stability simply isn't a factor. So that means our uh, adjust allow bending stress is just going to be equal to our reference allowable bending stress. And then we have our maximum moment that's going to be uh, fairly straightforward. And the beam length. Okay, now this is where it gets a little tricky. We can't just use the length calculation from previously. We're instead going to have to use this equa these equations here. So I'm going to go ahead and copy these. Or copy this. And plop that. Oh, I don't want that. So let's go ahead and get that. Oh, that is copy protected. Let's go ahead and snip then. Okay. Let's get that. Okay. So we have that. Plop that there. Did I get that right one? Let me see. Uh, nope, that is actually uh, incorrect. Sorry about that. Grab the wrong one. Would, it would be helpful if I would grab the right one. We're looking for M1 here, which is equal to this here. So we need to fix. So we have basically this is M1 here. So I'm just going to call that M1 for uh, the sake of uh, convenience. And L. Let's look how this is defined. L is now equal to, in this in these equations, L is just the first uh, span of the beam. So in this case, L is gonna be equal to 10 feet. And then our cantilever length is gonna be equal to, is, is this variable A, and A is equal to, um, A is equal to five feet in this case. So um, we're gonna need to modify our formula Basically, instead of, uh, if you think about uh, solving this equation M1 for L, uh, or for W, it's the same as the previous one, except in, we're changing the denominator. So we have L plus A quantity squared times L minus A quantity squared. Again, just applying some statics. Uh, let's see, that didn't work out too well. What do we got? Something is not right. So uh, let me think. There's some sort of error here. Oh, let me give me a second. I'll pop back and we'll take a look. Ah, all right. I think I found the problem. Uh, first of all, M. We should we shouldn't be using M, but M1, and there should also be an L squared term in here for this one here. And we then have a allowed load of 337 pounds per foot. So we can see that for the positive moment region, it actually is going to have, a, you know, super abundant capacity, and that should be no surprise, con that considering that it is continuously braced. 
Next, let us consider the negative moment region. Now this is going to be a bit tricky. So for the negative moment region, um, we could say that uh, if, if you the value for the moments in M2 here is going to be relatively straightforward to calculate. We can just calculate it according to W squared over 2. Uh, in other words, the formula for a cantilever. So that's not going to be a problem. What is going to be a problem, however, is the unbraced length. So if you wanted to be really conservative, you could actually go and say, oh, the unbraced length, it, we could use the entire length of the cantilever here because the inflection point doesn't really provide um, doesn't really provide uh, any lateral restraint. However, though, if you think about it, at that point, the moment is zero. So it's a bit unusual to use that entire unbraced length. If you wanted to be very, very conservative for the negative moment region, you could use the first span, that 10 feet, as the unbraced length. But uh, I think that's got a little too conservative. Although, if you wanted to be conservative, you could do that. But I think in this case, it's probably a little too conservative uh, for our case. Again, though, the problem is that um, the reason that we need to do a different a separate calculation is that we do not have bracing anymore for our negative moment region. We are the beam is going to be braced along the top of it, um, and that will provide a uh, that will provide continuous bracing for po any positive moment region. But for the cantilever, which is the ne which is the negative moment region, we effectively have no bracing. So if we consider this uh, here, so let's go ahead and say, uh, consider negative moment region. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy everything from the previous calculation up here and go ahead and redo that. Okay, now our unbraced length, well, that's still gonna be five feet. Again, if I wanted to be really conservative, I could use the larger value, the, the um, left span, but you wouldn't want to take the distance from the unbrace, uh, from the inflection point to the support. You'd either want to use just the five foot cantilever, or you could use, if you really want to be really conservative, the entire span length here, but the uh, inflection point doesn't provide lateral bracing, so I wouldn't use that distance, uh, the distance from the, the cantilever support to the uh, inflection point. Okay, so, but I'm just going to go ahead and use this here, with the 5 feet. Uh, material properties aren't going to change. Our unbraced length over depth is now uh, 5.3 feet. However, um, let's go ahead and take a look at our table 3.3.3. Now, uh, if we look at a cantilever case now, for a uniformly distributed live load, or uniformly distributed load, where the unbraced length let to, to depth ratio is less than 7, we can just use 1.33 times the unbraced length. So our effective length now, in this case, is going to be 1.33 times the unbraced length. And our slender initial ratio is less than 50, so we're okay there. Our critical buckling stress, that's going to just cascade through. And we'll get our adjusted allowable bending stress, that's not a problem. And our applied maximum moment, that's not going to change either. However, just like last time, what will change is our um, our uh, distributed load that we can get from our maximum moment. Because in this case, we're dealing with what our equations uh, define as M2. And if I go back here and get a snapshot like this, where was M2? That is just WA squared over 2. So uh, W then uh, is going to be equal to, if we think, if we run that equation backwards, because this is equal to M2, this is then going to be equal to M times 2 divided by A squared. And that would be then 169.01 uh, pounds per foot. So if you have a very, so in other words, uh, I like this example because it illustrates how complex these type of problems can get. In other words, if you have a, uh, especially when you have like a continuous beam, where you have regions that are in positive moment and negative moment, uh, you need to actually consider what kind of bracing you're actually providing. And you can end up having several different cases of, or several different combinations of lengths, spans, and support, and uh, bracing conditions. And you need to work through all the different permutations and see uh, where, now, in this particular uh, problem, I was calculating a 
maximum allowable distributed load. More typically, you're calculating a maximum allowable stress. And so you need to calculate that stress, um, not only in different spans, but in different uh, cases of positive and negative moments. So the key thing is that with beam stability, you need to be very careful in choosing what cases you're looking at, and you need to make sure to apply your judgment and your knowledge of mechanics and statics in looking and making sure that you're considering all the relevant cases of bracing, um, loading, and uh, support. And I think that'll do it for today. As we've seen, calculating the beam stability factor can be quite tricky, and in some cases open to engineering judgment and interpretation. In considering beam stability, we need to consider loading and support conditions positive and negative moment regions, and how and where lateral support is actually provided in terms of top of beam, bottom of beam, etc. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. If you found this video interesting or useful, please like, comment, and subscribe to make the robots happy. If you want to help like, make content like this possible, see the link to our Patreon page in the video description. I would of course like to thank our existing patrons, Stefan, Edmund, and Logan. Thank you again for all your support. Regardless, we'll be back soon with another video in this series. Our next video will be more beam uh, stability considerations, this time looking at the NDS's prescriptive methods, uh, sort of more traditional methods, uh, more traditional prescriptive methods for addressing beam stability. I look forward to seeing y'all then, and as always, thank you. <laughs>